Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, we are doing some lighting today. We uh, are trying to put in a little bit of a of a light distribution kind of a system into our renderer. Uh, that's just designed to sort of give the light a softer, more bounced around look to it. Uh, and we've just started it. We have to finish the downward pass before we can really start playing with it at all. Uh, and so that's what we are going to be doing today. Today is day 396. Uh, so you want to start with day 395 source code. Uh, if that's something you are going to follow along with at home, that is the source code you want to be using. So where we left off, uh, yeah, it was yesterday. There we go. Uh, so where we left off is we had just started with the downward iteration uh, for our sampler. And what we've got here, uh, let's see, so here we go. Here's our multi-light down. Uh, so what we've got here is something which goes through uh, the various textures uh, that we've got, the front emit, back emit, and the NP, uh, and then looks at a particular texel's surface color and uh, and it's um, NP data, which is the normal and location of that particular uh, reflector. And it tries to you know, do something with it. And right now we don't do anything in particular. It's, it's set up to do something, but we don't actually do anything with it. Uh, now, one thing that we haven't done yet is the UV step parameter is not set to anything in particular. Uh, or wait, no, we did, we did that. Uh, so I guess we've done most of the compulsories then, because we did set the UV step to be uh, the correct value, I, I believe. Uh, so let's double check that we did that, because this is actually, and I think I wanted to rename this as well from UV step, step uh, to source UV step, uh, because it's, there's two UV steps that you could think about uh, in this particular situation, right? There's the UV step of the destination parameter, and there's the UV step of the source parameters. Uh, and since they're at different levels of the texture, they're necessarily different. So let's go ahead you just make sure that this is correct everywhere. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I think we're doing everything correctly here, at least as far as I know, in terms of what we are presenting uh, to the graphics card now. And we just need some actual code that's gonna do something useful, right? Uh, and one of the things that might be good for us to do here uh, is, you know, at the moment we don't really need it because we know what the up textures look like. So we know we're just looking at the downs. But in the future, what we might want to do is when we do handmade internal, rather than using the same textures for the up and the down, use a different set of textures so that we can compare what the it looks like before and after uh, doing the down sampling. At the moment, though, I just like to take a look at this uh, now that we have it all in place and just see what we're doing here and, and try to figure out uh, roughly what we need to be uh, roughly what this needs to look like uh, as we go forwards. So you can see that we've got a dest front emit and a dest back emit happening here. Those two are getting computed and they're being placed um, here. One of the things that I need to do is, if you, if you remember, the lighting is going to be additive to a large extent uh, in this case. Like, in other words, we've got a situation where at any given level of the texture, we need to add in the new lighting that we compute because we certainly don't want to take out any lighting that was already at the place that we're talking about that we knew about on the way up. So we just wanna be adding new lighting in from other sources. And that's very important. 
So if we take a look at how this is executing, we're putting the dest uh, front and back emit in here. What we want to do is the dest front emit and the dest back emit uh, both are raw lighting computations that we will be doing when we fill in this transfer light equation. Uh, and at the moment, even if we assume that that was happening, we're still a little bit wrong because we have here a reflection color and we're not using that reflection color. So what we want to do is we want to take the desk front emit and the desk back emit and multiply them by our reflection color because whatever light we compute as hitting our surface, we want that light uh, we want that, that bit of light to correctly uh, take on the surface properties. Now, what we probably want to do, you know, instead of doing it right here, is if we ever want to try to do some kind of approximate specular with this, which I don't think we really can, but if we ever did, we would need to have multiple pieces of information like the specular power and things like that in here. Uh, so what I can do instead is just move that computation in here since we're passing the reflected color to the transfer light equation. We can take whatever the emitted light is that we're going to be transferring and multiply it by that ref C. And that would be fine. So that's at least one thing we have to do. The other thing we have to do is make it so this is additive. And in order to make it so that it's additive, what we have to do is when we actually use the multi-light down, uh, in this, let's see here, in this routine where we do, which apparently I can't find for some reason. Where is it? There it is. Uh, so inside compute light transport here, what's going to happen when we use uh, program begin multigrid light down is when it computes these results, we're going to want them to add into the texture the way we're doing it currently. Uh, so what that means is we need to do a GL enable and a GL disable uh, for blend because we need it, uh, we need the blending, the blend unit to take the output of this uh, light pass and add it to whatever was in the texture beforehand. Uh, so the blend func that we want to use here is going to be GL1, GL1 in the sense that we uh, we don't want to modulate anyone by any alpha or anything. The values that we're outputting are literally just the amount of light that's being added. So we want to take 100% of the destination and 100% of the source light and combine them together we don't want any attenuation of them by anyone's values at all. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's okay uh, because as far as I know, nobody is using blending anywhere else uh, other than in sort of these old routines that we don't support at the moment. Um, so we should be able to just let that roll uh, and that should all be good. Now, uh, what you'll see here Uh, is that now that I've switched it to add, we're getting some uh, kind of odd results there, right? Uh, which is that, oh my. That's really pretty cool. Um, that has nothing to do probably with what we want to be having happening, but it's really neat. Um, anyway, uh, this is a little bit surprising to me and I'm not sure I have an explanation for it which makes me a little nervous. Uh, now that we switch, switch the blend mode to add, uh, we're getting the old lighting in here as well on top of the new lighting. The reason that that is odd to me is you'll notice that the whole screen is yellow but we're seeing a red and green dot. Now, the reason that that's weird is because yellow should be fully 1-1 one, one, uh, or, you know, the maximum, that bright yellow is the maximum you could get on either channel. How adding yellow to something that's red gives you red still, I have no idea. And uh, just to underscore why that's odd, 
uh, if you the the only way I can think of that that would be happening legitimately, meaning not because of a bug in our program, uh, is if it's because hey these lights are set at more than one for their initial value. Because if you remember, uh, the seed lighting was that way. Uh, so where was that seed lighting? You can see here, uh, the seed lighting had these as, as 100 uh, and 10. Now, if I was to drop these down, the problem is we wouldn't be getting that bright yellow propagated back, I assume. Uh, you know, maybe we would, but if we didn't, um, yeah, okay, so this is just odd. So I think we need to investigate this uh, a little bit further because you can see now uh, I'm not even getting uh, any values that are over one. So how you could have a yellow light everywhere and still end up with, uh, with what we're seeing, I have no idea, right? Uh, so this is, this is just peculiar to me. Uh, in, and again, uh, I suppose it could have something to do with the power of the lights. I'll drop them down even further so that I know we're mostly going to be within the, the range that can be directly converted from float uh, to 8-bit color for display because I don't know what's happening in that phase uh, exactly. Um, but yeah, you can still see, I mean, there just doesn't, I just can't see any explanation uh, for this at all. So there's got to be something buggy about the way we're doing it. Uh, and I would like to figure out what. So let's investigate further. Uh, let's see how we're getting this, this data. So when we take uh, these samples here, so here's the up pass, which as far as I can tell, isn't doing anything wrong or anything obviously wrong. In the down pass, I'm sampling from the parents. Uh, and when I'm doing this, you can see me adding the, the light transfer equations in here. Uh, I guess I am blowing out the range of the float, that is true, uh, because I'm adding four things and I'm not dividing them out by anything. Uh, and, you know, so if we're talking about trying to just get something that can be represented in a float, that's going to blow it out. Now, I don't care about representing them in a float at the limit because what I'm doing is I'm summing a bunch of light values, which can be arbitrary. And at the end, we'll have a mapping step that maps that down to something. And we're not doing that at the moment. Uh, but, you know, in the meantime, if I wanted to, I can keep this, uh, this stuff at a reasonable level by using the, uh, uh, the a number of things summed and quartering them, right? So looking at that, uh, that looks more like what I would expect. Why not quartering them, which allows the float to overflow, why that produces the result it does, I really couldn't tell you. I guess it's possible that the way the mapping works is just by taking the f mod of the value that would make sense i guess but even so i don't know um so let's suppose we crank that up uh, uh, you know over time a little bit uh just to see uh roughly what we get and again i'm just experimenting here because i don't understand exactly what i'm seeing uh and i want to gain a little bit more insight into it uh, so you can kind of see that blending process, right? It keeps working around the two points, but never really seems to change what's on the interior of those light sources. And that is just really perplexing. Uh, I have no explanation for that. I, I really wish I did. Uh, but I so totally don't. And... Uh, And just to be extra clear on what I'm talking about, uh, when you look at these two uh, dots in the middle here, 
what I'm expecting to have happen and what is not happening is I expect those two points to be getting brighter themselves as I transfer more light from the parent. Um, so as I say, instead, that will double the power of the light transmitted by the parent, right? Uh, but as I look there, what you can see is that the area around the light uh, is having that happen. Ah, you know what? I think I know why that is. Uh, that's because of the ref C. That's because of this, isn't it? Um, so if I was to take out, because the ref C on a light is zero, so there will be no light transmitted to the light surface. So if I instead was to do this, there we go. Okay. Uh, so that was actually just a case of me thwarting myself there, right? Okay. Now I can still move the uh, hero around here. And this is some bizarre stuff that's happening, uh, to say the least. Uh, and you can kind of see there how our filtering is going to have to get better, because you can see what's happening uh, with that sort of uh, bizarre light propagation, since it happens on uh, right now on two by two boundaries. Uh, you end up with sort of this this visible sort of filtering error as you go. Uh, but if we clamp that light a little bit more, right, so now you can see me sort of moving it around here. Uh, if we clamp that light a little bit more, uh, then you can see that it's, 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 it's still kind of reasonable at, at a level that doesn't, when it doesn't feed back on itself and becomes quite so obvious. Uh, so anyway, so we have uh, a couple paths we can go down here. So if, if I do do ref C in here and prevent it from contributing to a thing that's already an emitter, which I don't know if we want to do, uh, because I don't know if we want to have such a thing as an emitter reflector. Uh, in the real world, I don't know that there's a whole lot of stuff that's like that. Sometimes there is. Um, but typically lights are so bright if you look directly at the element uh, that you don't super distinguish, like you don't super need to talk about light that gets uh, reflected off them necessarily, but you know, either way. Um, so if we talk about uh, these lights here, I'm going to go ahead and beef the power up on these lights um, and I'm going to see what happens as I sort of uh, change that since now we've got a, a semi-stable situation occurring there uh, just for the fake seed lighting. So I'm going to return these back to one and one first. Now I'm going to go to 10 1. And now I'm going to go to 100. 1. And lastly, I'm going to go to 10. or 110, I should say. All right. Uh, so now we've got our two lights and they have sort of quite a bit of outsized power. Uh, and you can see some problems that we're already gonna have to start tackling, right? You can see the problems with the filtering approaches there, where when you line up well for the filtering, uh, you get further, you get more bleed than if you don't. And so as we start to work with these, right, we're gonna have to uh, try to do a good job with keeping these things relatively smooth in that way, right? Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's just, again, a battle that you, anytime you discretize something on a grid, uh, you end up in a situation where you're going to have to kind of uh, fight that sampling problem. 
So let's go ahead and say that uh, this is where I'm going to leave it for right now. Uh, again, we haven't done any of the lighting stuff yet. We just set up, set up our filtering. Uh, and I think what I'd like to do now, uh, probably, because without this, I feel like it's going to be, well, I don't know. I, so I have two directions I can go now. Either I can go and say, all right, we've got this in place. We need to go work out how the lighting works. Uh, let's, before we do that, have a way that we can switch back and forth between the game mode and the test mode, right? And in order to do that, we need to go make the uh, ability in the renderer to specify that a surface is emissive. And uh, that will have to be something that gets put into uh, the render passes, right? So that's what we want to do, and I'm just trying to think about ooh, how we're going to do that exactly, or you know what the what the way is that we're going to do that. Uh, so we need to do that, and the reason that I'm thinking that I might want to go do that now is because as we start to progress forward on the lighting, one of the things that we're not going to know is how good the lighting is at any particular time, right? So, you know, because this is all going to be about approximate light transfer stuff and we've got this, the system set up now to sort of play with it uh, and play around with it, one of the things we're going to want to do once we get something working is we're going to want to flip over to the game and see what does the lighting look like if we actually try to use it in the game. And right now we can't do that because there's no way to get the game. The game doesn't specify any lights. And we don't have a transfer from the game to the lighting system and the lighting system back to the game. So I think that's what I'd like to do since we haven't. I don't want to get too far down this road because once we go down the lighting road, I want to finish it. Uh, I don't want to have to ping pong back. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do now is just stop it here. Uh, and we'll leave that. Maybe we'll leave that for next week, like writing the lighting equations. Because uh, I think what I want to do now is get it so we can see the results of the lighting equations in the game. And we should already be able to do that, like, if we were to look at something like this in the game, we should see the world lit in this really unusually weird way, right? We should see a blobby red splotch of light and a green and yellow splotch of light uh, around the character, and that's all we would see, and the rest would be dark, right? We would see literally this as the light mask overlay uh, for the game, right? So if we wanted to go down that route, let's take a look at what we would have to do here, right? Because again, this is going to be pretty complicated. Okay. Um, so here's the status of the game render at the moment. Uh, it is using some lighting and we're basically going to pull that lighting out, right? Uh, to a certain degree. And we can pull it out in steps potentially as well. Uh, but anyway. So what we want to be able to do here is right now we only specify one light. We specify a light position. And a light position isn't at all what we want. What we want to be able to do instead is randomly select any sprite that we want and turn it into a light source, right? That's what we, that's what we actually want. Because that way we can just have as many lights as we want in the scene and then they get rendered in and processed as lights. So we don't have to have some fixed number of lights with some fixed number of positions. They're just sprites can be illuminated or not, right? And any sprite that is marked as illuminated gets rendered, you know, emissively. And any sprite uh, that is, uh, any sprite that is not that uh, is just rendered as a reflector, okay? So that's what we want to do. Uh, so if we think about how that's going to have to happen, um, as we look into this a little bit further, uh, the complexity here, a lot of that complexity comes from the fact that we've got depth peeling happening. So <clears throat> uh, we've got a situation where we're going to be rendering these four depth peels, right? And you can kind of see where we've got the multi-sample depth peeling happening here. 
Uh, you can see this, this is the, the depth peel loop uh, where we set up our frame buffers for rendering to the depth peels. And we have this multi-sample resolve that happens in here that smacks things down uh, after it, it's, uh, uh, after we've sort of dealt with them. And if we take a look at what we're doing in that resolve multi-sample, uh, we use, let's see, where is it? Uh, in the compile resolve multi-sample function, which we have here, uh, you can see that what we're doing is we do some Texel fetches uh, to determine what the range is of the depth. So we do this. Um, and we go whatever the depth range is, split it in half, and we're going to take everybody who's um, on the front side of that is going to be considered in for the depth, uh, that, that particular depth peel, right? So everyone on the, the downside of that um, will get rendered on the next peel as well, uh, whereas everyone on the front side of it doesn't. Uh, I also, for whatever reason, and I don't really know what the reason is, we elected not to sort the samples based on that. I don't remember if we tested which one looked better and determined that it looked better to average them all uh, or what happened here. So, you know, honestly, here's a question. Should we just double check that while I'm in here? We probably should. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a look at the light stuff here. I'm gonna pull this light stuff uh, uh, out for a minute. Um, So I'm going to just render the whole screen with Fulbright, which there you go. Uh, and what I could do is leave directional on, but not distance as well, uh, which I guess would be nice so we could see the edges of those cubes better. Uh, so if I did directional instead of distance, uh, what I could do is say um, light distance, camera distance here. Uh, let's see here, light distance. Uh, one over light distance. I could just say light distance equals 1.0 or something. Well, actually, light strength R divided by light distance squared. Yeah, so I can think. I think I can just do that. Uh, well, actually, now I, I take that back because we need to normalize it properly. So I think what I actually need to do is do that after the fact. Uh, so we've got light distance equals length to light. Then this normalizes that. Um, then here, this is the part we do light strength, um, and we compute it with the light distance squared. Uh, what I want to do there, I think, is just do light distance equals 1.0 so that we won't uh, modify that strength at all, right? Um, so there we've got it nice and bright now, so I should be able to see. And just looking at the edges of things, I, I don't really like the fact that I still get that. Let me, maybe if I fix the light position so it doesn't move around uh, would be the other thing I could do, right? So I could say light P equals, you know, Uh, and so there I can see a lot more cleanly, right? Because this is more like the original uh, where the light is, is sort of semi-stationary, although it's you know, not quite. So again, just looking at the artifacting here from the depth peel, you know, you can see some of it. You can see a little bit in there. It's hard to see which because we worked on making it hard to see, uh, but you still can sort of see it a little bit. Again, I'm just looking for artifacts there. And let's take a look now if I change uh, the way we're re re um, reproducing the samples here. Uh, so the way we've got this is the sample count here we run through 
uh, when we do 1.0 over the sample count, what I wanna do is take the, this GL frag depth here, and I basically wanna say like, if you are on the positive side of that, so when we come through these samples and we fetch one, uh, the if statement we're gonna want here is uh, for depth being sort of great, I don't remember which direction depth ever goes in here. So depth max is zero, depth min is 1.0. So basically if the depth is higher than the GL frag depth, we will take it, right? Um, and we'll also introduce sample div here uh, and use that instead. Because we only want to divide by the number that we actually got, right? I guess unsigned integers are not a thing. Yeah, so that's no good. That eliminates a lot of the blending we were getting there. It, although that's a little bit odd to me, so I'm kind of wondering why that's so bad. Um, Oh, because this is backwards. Never mind. Yeah, I read that wrong. My bad. Uh, still no better though. Uh, but yeah, I believe because if depth min is one, that means that we're using less ones uh, for that. I guess we don't really know depth min, depth max, whether I named those properly either, but we've tested both directions and neither one worked. So I suppose uh, we know that that's the case either way. Uh, so I just wanted to just wanted to double check that there wasn't something uh, better we could do there than what we were doing. So we'll leave that as is. I'll take this out. And I think we can just leave this as is. All right, um, so the only goal now that I have is again trying to figure out how to get uh, everything into the lighting system proper. Now, the way that this needs to happen again is pretty tricky, uh, I think. And the reason for that is because of the depth fields. If we weren't gonna try and do a sort of actual uh, three-dimensional lighting, this would be a lot simpler. Uh, but because we are going to try and do actual three-dimensional lighting, it's going to be a little bit more complicated. But that's okay. Uh, complicated stuff is what we do on Handmade Hero because, after all, we're supposed to be teaching programming and picking things that are incredibly easy would not be very interesting for that end, even though that might be what you should do on your game if you don't care. So. Uh, what we want to do here is we want to take a look at how we might get this information out of the renderer uh, depth field process into some bitmaps that we can use. And what we'll do is we'll concentrate on the first bitmap, uh, but let, what we'll do is we'll try to remember that, what we can, uh, that we want to eventually do the lighting on all four depth fields so that we can have a deep lighting solve that actually has some, uh, dimension, some of that third dimension to the lighting bounce. Uh, ceilings and floors and stuff like that that wouldn't nor ordinarily happen if we just did it in pure screen space uh, with only one. So what I want to do here is take a look at how the depth peel uh, renders are set up. So you can see uh, in the OpenGL frame buffers thing here, we've got a color handle and a depth handle that we are normally writing to for each, each of our depth peels, right? Uh, so you can see on here we've got a depth peel buffer and a depth peel resolve buffer. 
and there's a frame buffer for each of those. And so what happens is we resolve uh, the frame buffer with the color and depth handle, we resolve that from one that's multi-sampled to one that's not. So each of these uh, depth peel and uh, depth peel resolves here, each of those gets sort of smacked together. Um, right, we render one of them into the depth peel buffer, then we do a depth peel resolve to the depth peel resolve buffer, which smacks down the multi-sampling at whatever the multi-sampling was set to down to a single sample, which we then use for the rest of the process. So in order to effectively mimic that, right, what we need to do is include emission in this equation somehow. Now, we already have uh, an RGB, you know, value in there, which could serve as our surface color value. And we already know the depth and uh, uh, the depth of the thing because the depth peel buffer gives us that, right? So we have the D value and we have the surface RGB value. What we don't have is front side, back side emission, and we don't have the normal, right? Now we could easily get the normal in the shader, but we don't have anywhere to store it. So we need to have somewhere that we're going to store the shader uh, going forward. We also need somewhere to store the emissions somehow. And we, again, need to store that at a high resolution potentially because we may want that value to be uh, fairly granular. Now, we could still store it in 8-bit and upsample it later to float uh, because we don't need the initial lighting values to be that precise. We only need our lighting computations to store that precise as they iterate. So we could use just 8-bit color for recording the emitters. Um, that wouldn't be too big of a deal. But regardless of what we do, we're going to need more write bandwidth here, which is a little scary, but we're going to need it. Uh, because inside these depth field buffers, we're going to have to write, in addition to uh, just the, the information we were writing, we're going to have to write more stuff uh, that we can um, pick, up by the, uh, pick up with the lighting system later. Uh, all right, so let's think about how we want to do that. Um, I think what I might want to do is these OpenGL frame buffer things here. I think, again, uh, maybe we won't really be able to use that as a utility class so much because it seems like we constantly have to make things that are more complicated than that. Uh, so in the same way that we have a light buffer here, we may need to end up with a peel buffer here that has all of this information uh, in it, right? Um, and that seems pretty likely. So if we were going to do that, uh, what we would end up with, much like, like we have the light buffer there, uh, we would have a peel buffer here, uh, which is a similar thing. It would end up with something like this, uh, which is the multi-sample frame buffer handle, the multi-sample color handle, the multi-sample uh, multi depth handle. Then it would have the frame buffer handle, color handle, depth handle, right? Uh, but now, in addition to these things, uh, it's going to have more color handles, right? Uh, and what we could do as well, I suppose, is instead of just one uh, color handle here, I suppose we could do something like this, right? So we could say something like there's going to be more than one color handle potentially for an OpenGL frame buffer. So you could say um, OpenGL color handle type. Uh, and you could say that the color handles in here was uh, OpenGL color uh, surface reflect, OpenGL color uh, front emit, OpenGL color back emit, OpenGL color NP. Uh, So in a circumstance like that, what we would have is each frame buffer would have a couple different targets to it, and we would pretty much just use exactly the same uh, 
process that we use for everything else, it's just we're gonna extend the amount stored by a lot more values. Uh, so the emissions there are, yeah, all, uh, I, I guess the, the emissions there are just kind of all recorded um, for us. Now, what we could say, and I guess I don't know that there's any reason not to say this, it seems like we probably should just say it. Um, What I'm trying to decide is, I don't know if front emit or back emit is, I don't know that it's necessary to save that information. While we probably wanna have stuff like that in the actual, uh, while we wanna do stuff that deals with propagation direction in the actual solve, I don't know that we need to remember that information on the actual render. And the reason that I say that is because on the render, it seems like a lot of the times things are only gonna emit out of their front face probably, uh, not necessarily out of their back face. However, I don't know that that's true. Um, and I guess more specifically what we could say is we could just make it so that things just emit period. Uh, I don't know, that's a really tough call. Uh, being able to specify the lighting in either direction of an emitter seems useful uh, because for example if you were talking about like a light on the face of one of the cubes you would not want it to emit out the back which is what it would do if it had back emission um, but at the same time you want situations where like if a sprite is supposed to be lit up in all directions it's omnidirectional uh, you kind of want some way of specifying that as well so in a sense, maybe what I really want here is more of just a emit uh, value that is like RGBA, where A is the sphericalness of it. Um, I mean, for lack of a better term, uh, where's my Milton? There it is. I really want someone to figure out why Milton loses connection to the tablet all the time. It, it doesn't really make any sense to me. Like, what even is happening such that that can occur? You know, there's gotta be some, all right, why can I not open? Uh, there's gotta be some reason for that. I was looking at it, the source before the stream started, but I didn't get far enough in to figure out, uh, to come up with a plausible idea of how that can happen. Um, because I've never had a program w where that happens before. Like I've never had an, another program, like an, any art package, ever lose connection to the tablet like that, where it thinks that it's mouse input all of a sudden in, instead of tablet input. Uh, and so there's gotta be some explanation for it, but I don't know what that explanation would be and I'm very curious. Uh, anyway, so what I was saying here is uh, emission specification. Uh, is what I want to do here is I want to say, okay, if I have a direction, so I've got, whenever I render anything on the screen, I know what the direction is of the thing I rendered, right? So for example, if you take the hero, which is like a sprite card that's standing up, it's normal is like gonna be pointing out, you know, sort of slightly down and slightly toward the viewer. So if I wanted to say that the hero was emissive, there's multiple ways I might want to say that, right? And so what I was thinking is if we had RGB is like the color of the emission, but A was like a term that told us the spread of the emission. So, you know, if A is zero, then it's just a line of light. Uh, and if A is one, it's like 360 degrees or something, you know, and 0.5 would be like 180. So it would just, it would like, you know, kind of control that. Um, then we could sort of have a specification which only used one bitmap and four values rather than having a front and a back emission, which even that doesn't really capture very much information because the front and the back 
you don't really know if that was supposed to be an omni emitter or two fairly straight emitters um, pointing in opposite directions, right? And they're gonna have different lighting qualities. Uh, and it doesn't tell you very much about the up and down emission and so on. So I feel like maybe a, co a conical uh, sort of description there that widens out to 360 in some way is maybe a little bit more of a useful specification. Um, and at the moment, we'll just use zero or one uh, to represent whether it should be all in the front emitter or front and back emitter when we transfer it over. Um, that seems to me to be the most reasonable thing at the moment. Uh, and we can always fuss with that term as, as we get further down the lighting path to figure out exactly how lighting should be working in our lighting transfer. Uh, we can then go back and tween, tweak that A parameter to give us the most control we can get out of one parameter that does make sense um, through the rest of the lighting pipeline. So I feel like that's probably what I want to do. So I would say it's just like emit um, uh, so it's kind of like you know So in this case, we still have the depth buffer, so we really don't need the depth in this case. So I don't really know what we want to store here. I suppose what we could do uh, is just store the NX and Y, uh, and that's it, right? Uh, so maybe this is just like 16-bit NX, 16-bit NY. So we use 132-bit texture, but we store the normals at higher resolution, right? We could do that. I don't know that we really care about the high resolution. We could maybe just use a 16-bit texture. Uh, so, you know, just use an X and Y and just don't worry about it. Because again, uh, the depth buffer here has that information in it. So we don't really need to store the depth in, in the render passes. It's already in the depth buffer. We don't need to store it. It's just redundant uh, to put it there again. Uh, so this is emit RGB and then like spread at alpha. Uh, and then surface effect is just like flect RGB. Uh, so this would again, this would be uh, giving us, you know, quite a bit more right bandwidth requirements, which isn't great. Um, and when I say quite a bit more, I mean like a lot more, right? Uh, because essentially we're multiplying by th two plus the amount of right bandwidth we had to do on the multi-sample pass, uh, which is the worst possible pass because that's the one that could write the most stuff. Uh, so it's not good, right? But we need to get um, that information in there somehow. And like I said, we're basically multiplying it by two plus uh, because we have the surface reflect uh, RGB and uh, the you know coverage L A rather. That's what we are currently writing. So this doesn't increase it at all because that's just what we already were writing. Uh, but then we have another bitmap of the same size plus uh, a little extra, plus 16 bit extra. So it's like two and a half times the right bandwidth. Uh, that we're gonna suck down on those depth field passes. Am I that concerned about it? No, because I mean, at the end of the day, you could always turn lighting off entirely and still play the game if you were trying to get it to run on like a Raspberry Pi or whatever. Uh, and anyone who's running this on a PC probably has a graphics card that can eat this whole thing for breakfast 12 times over. Uh, you know, we're not doing anything even close to as complicated as, uh, you know, Battlefield 1 or something probably is. So. Six of one half dozen of the other. You can also drop the resolution down, play at a lower resolution, play at less than 60 frames a second. 30 frames a second at half resolution, blah, 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 quarter resolution is gonna dramatically improve that speed because again, it's just right speed. We're not doing a whole lot of ops on these at the moment. Uh, so I say, uh, what the heck? We'll try it, right? 
uh, and, uh, and, and we'll see what we get. Now the question here is, do we need anything else? Uh, we've got two of these uh, three to bit bitmaps, and then we've got this kind of weird bitmap here. Again, I don't see any way to really do anything smarter than that. Uh, and in terms of storing any other data, you know, into this NP bitmap here, we could put more information, uh, like whether there's specular, like how reflective the surface is, or something like that, uh, like a specular power kind of a thing. And uh, so we could say that, let's just say that these are all 32-bit ones, and just say it's 3x the bandwidth, uh, and we have like LP0 and LP1 here, uh, and we'll just say to do KC, two parameters here that can control the lighting, right? So eventually we'll let you specify two parameters that up to two parameters that control the lighting. We'll snuggle them in with the NXNY in this uh, NP, uh, we'll call it an MPL texture. Uh, and then hopefully in the future we'll have, you know, some degree of, of something we can do with those in the lighting to change the surface look uh, based on something that you specify when you create the sprite information, right? Uh, all right, so let's go ahead and, and plow f forward with that ridiculousness here. So when we pass uh, the flags and stuff here, what I want to do is on create frame buffer, I want to specify how many color buffers it has. Uh, so rather than just a, a has color thing here, uh, I think what I want to do instead is say uh, that the color flag, either we can make a color flag for each of these, but I don't know that that's super useful. I think what we could do is just pass how many of them you want, right? So what we could do is say that we've just got this, uh, like so, and then when we're doing the color ones, what we'll do is like, uh, we'll just say color buffer count. Um, and the color buffer, buffer count will just serve as like a for i loop essentially, uh, where we allocate that many of these. Uh, so we'll say like color index equals zero, color index is less than color buffer count, plus plus color index. Uh, for good measure, let's assert that the color buffer count uh, is less than or equal to the number that we expect to have, or I guess we could even just say whatever the array count is of that place that we're gonna store them. Uh, which in this case is the color handle array. And so here we've got, you know, color index ranging from here to here. So when we put this into a storage location, uh, we'll just say, okay. Uh, and the same thing will happen, oops. Uh, the same thing will happen here. We'll add the color index uh, to the E number passing and we'll grab the proper color handle out. Uh, so that would let us create, you know, as many of those as we wanted to. Um, I thought I deleted that. Did I actually delete the wrong one? No, I guess not. Um, and they, uh, again, so this one's gonna have to loop through all of these. Oops. So we're gonna look at each of the color handles on cleanup and we're just gonna delete any that, that were allocated in that frame buffer. Uh, the frame buffer color resolve flags is no longer a thing. Um, so we're always gonna just assume that that, get, that gets passed down uh, for anyone who allocates a uh, texture uh, uh, yeah, frame buffer, they're gonna have to pass how many of those they expect to have. So here where we do create frame buffer for the OpenGL resolve buffer, we know that, that once we do our final resolve, we're only gonna have one color buffer. Uh, so we can just forget about um, creating any, any more of them there. Uh, similarly here in create frame buffer for the depth fields, uh, this is the place where if we wanted to just mimic exactly the operations that we're currently doing, we'd say one, we know we wanna go further than that now, uh, and we wanna pass uh, the full color count. Now we won't use those buffers, we'll just create them. 
Uh, and uh, again, since we know we also have to downsample them, we'll create both the downsampled version and the fully multi-sampled version. Uh, so now when we're using these color handles anywhere, we're going to have to do uh, binds on them. And in order to do that, uh, we're going to have to be a little bit more careful uh, about where we're writing things and how we're going to do that. Uh, so for the moment, I'm not going to deal with that at all. I'm just going to get things working the exact way they were by using color handle zero, which should always work in theory. Uh, and so now I just want to make sure that I can actually run this because we may have introduced a bug there, um, but it looks like we're all good. Uh, so we're still running correctly and everyone's happy and smiling uh, and doing all the things that, that we're doing. Okay, great, fine, whatever. So now we've got uh, those extra color handles here. We have to start thinking about what we're going to do with them. And uh, the, the tricky part here is just that uh, you can kind of see here in the light buffer where we do this uh, this dumb sequence color attachment stuff. Um, so the same thing that we did here where we have draw buffers, um, we're gonna have to do for our other frame buffer operations. So if we take a look at the frame buffers that we made uh, in create frame buffer here, where is that? Here it is. Uh, where we specify the color buffer count here. What we're gonna have to do is we're going to have to call the same stupid thing here. Uh, we're gonna have to call that on these to make sure that all of the color indices that we set up, uh, and I guess we should also make sure of that, uh, all of these that we set up, we're gonna have to make sure that uh, they all are, uh, that, that all of the sequences that we've um, set up of color buffers have this dumb sequence bound so that when we actually write to them, it knows what we were trying to write to. So at the end, uh, when we do this, the frame buffer, we need to make sure we call GL draw buffers with however many color buffers there were and the dumb sequence, which just has these things like sort of listed out in them. Uh, and I don't know how many of these we put in there, but you know. Uh, since to avoid having this more than once, uh, maybe what I should do is just make one of these at the top, right? Uh, which is like, oops. So it's a global variable that's just uh, all color attachments. Uh, and in here, we would literally just put everything. Oops. Now, we probably will never use this, but now we know that we just have uh, an array of all of these. Uh, and we can just use that anytime we want to do one of these binds. Okay. Uh, so let me delete all that. Uh, and again, we should be good to go. Uh, so now what you can see here is that even though we set up to draw to multiple buffers, uh, we can still see the game rendering just fine because uh, you know, even though we said we have multiple buffers to draw to, it'll just draw nothing, I believe. To, it'll just draw garbage to those buffers or zero to those buffers uh, that we're not drawing to. And since we're never displaying those buffers or using those buffers for any purpose whatsoever, uh, we really don't have to worry about uh, them at all. So that makes it now so that we can keep the whole thing running and slowly get to, uh, to a point where we're propagating the information 
from these new buffers that we have uh, out into the um, out into the the uh, uh, lighting system. So in order to do that, what we have to do is when we're drawing, we have to have a way of writing to uh, the actual uh, color buffers, right? So what you can see here is we've got this sort of uh, the, the Z bias program. The Z bias program is the, the version that we're using for both the first depth peel and all subsequent depth peels, uh, but it gets compiled in two different ways. Like one way uh, it does this texel fetch and clip uh, and another one it wouldn't do that. So what we need to process here uh, after we do this stuff, uh, all of this lighting information can go away. Uh, it can be uh, sort of put into a, a separate process. And in fact, I think I am going to do that now in preparation for moving things uh, along. So what I'd like to do is, uh, well, actually, you know what I could do? I could have it write the light information in uh, to the buffer right here, right, is one thing I could do. So let me pull out this information for the lighting, the way that we were doing it. So this whole thing is lighting, right? So let's pull out all of that lighting information. And I'm just gonna put it down here with our lighting code, uh, our multi-light down code. I'm just gonna put that here uh, in an if zero block. Uh, so we can put it back, oops, so we can put it back in later uh, when, when and if we want it, right? So now what we've got is when we're writing, we don't have any lighting that's going to be written into this buffer uh, in the depth peel, right? So the depth peel, uh, where is that? Here it is. Uh, so the depth peel now doesn't have to have any of this uh, light stuff happening in it. Uh, what's frag Z? Okay, so that's just set up there. This, this could be removed now because frag Z is not used. So with, this could just be that. So we were playing with that value before. Okay, uh, so now we don't have any lighting happening, or in theory we don't. Uh, and right, total light just needs to get pulled out of that multiply. Uh, so instead of multiplying this by anything, we're just gonna write the blank color in, like so. Uh, and now we have an unlit version of the game that's writing to the uh, surface reflectance uh, information, which is exactly what I want, right? Uh, and our goal now is to have something which will write, you know, uh, not, you know, addition, in addition to that, writing the lighting into buffers as well. And so what we want to do is do the same thing we do with frag chords here. Uh, some, some folks had said that we had some frag, there were problems on more modern cards with frag chord because it's deprecated. Uh, so one thing I might want to do right now while we're here is if we take a look at the GitHub issues, I believe... Uh, someone wrote in about this. Yeah, so so since we switched up, our shaders are already on 150. Uh, we don't want to be using GLFrag data apparently because of the deprecation problem. So uh, Martins, who I tend to trust on all things uh, meticulous because he often writes in with very specific uh, important changes for us, I feel like he may have the right idea here, which is to just say, uh, since we've said we're going to be using shader version 150, we could just switch to using layout specs, which are much better anyway, because layout specs are things that let you say what the bind location is for each variable so that you don't have to bother querying it at all, right? Um, so I think that's a pretty reasonable idea. And if we want to do that, I believe all we have to do is use the location 
mapping thing for zero, whatever. Uh, I think all we have to do here is specify um, I think all we have to do here is specify our own name and write to it as if it was GL frag cord, a uh, GL frag uh, color, and I think it will work. Uh, but again, uh, I'm not entirely certain. However, uh, we could certainly just try it and see what happens uh, and go from there. And, and I'm sure the folks who have the graphics cards that, uh, these, that will complain about these sorts of things will tell us uh, one way or the other which one happened. Uh, so let's take a look at the frag color situation as it stands. Uh, sorry, frag data. Uh, so here's the frag data stuff. Um, I'll go ahead and switch the lighting back on for a moment. Uh, so here's us writing to, whoa, why was that so slow? Oh, I don't know why that was so slow. Hmm. Uh, so what we can do here is we can verify that we're still writing to all of these, right? And now I'm going to go in and make that change and verify that the graphics card is still writing to each of them. So if we wanted to get rid of frag data here, uh, what we are saying we have to do is in the place where we've got frag data, we need to find our own value. Uh, and you can see here the layout location equals zero out v4 my output var. Uh, essentially what this is doing is declaring our own version of frag data. And the fact that it's an out va value with location equals zero, I guess, is how it's clear to the graphics card what we are trying to do. Um, so we can just say that this is frag color four, and then eventually when we write this out, uh, we just don't use frag data, we use frag color, right? Uh, in our case, we don't have four, we only have two. Uh, in this one, we do have four in the other one. Let's try it one at a time, see if that works. looks fine uh, so let's try same thing getting some weird like the frame rate slows way down randomly which I don't really know why and there it looks like we're doing okay with our right still so that looks like it's all good all right uh, so everything looks pretty reasonable there to me um, and the reason that I wanted to do that is because we're about to do that same thing uh, in all the rest of our shaders that have to write, because they're going to have to write to multiple outputs. So I don't want to make life even harder for folks who are on those other ones, uh, on those other cards. Uh, so we'll go ahead and close that issue out, and uh, I'm sure Martin's um, will tell us, or the original commenter, uh, Flo or Kujara, I don't know which of, I never know how to address people properly because a lot of people have different, um, a lot of people have different names than handles, and I never know whether they like to go by their handle or their name or whatever. I assume since it's regards Flo, I will say Flo. Uh, so either Martins or Flo will tell us uh, if that in fact fixed their problem on the more modern cards that pro probably are supposed to complain. This, this card probably should be complaining. 
uh, about frag data. It wasn't. Um, so, you know, whatevs. Uh, but anyway, so if that's the frag data information there, uh, let's see where else we've got it. Uh, it looks like just in the fake seed lighting. Uh, so I'll, again, just kind of propagate this uh, forward a bit more into all of our shaders. So uh, in this one here, uh, we'll just call that frag color. Uh, and then we are good to go. So now I will go ahead and start making some of these other uh, pieces of code work with the additional buffers that we have. So what you can see here, uh, vertex code, fragment code, uh, this one has a frag color that it's going to be uh, writing out here called result color. Uh, I'm gonna change that from result color to frag color for consistency. Uh, well, you know what? Maybe that's a bad idea because it looks like we used frag color for the incoming fragment color there. Hmm. Let me see. I would like to have a naming convention that makes some sense here that isn't weird. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I'm going to change this here from frag color to like uh, in color or something, and in UV. Uh, and then I'm gonna change result color to frag color. Uh, and it's not perfect, uh, but that's just the way it goes. You know what? Uh, this is the worst. You know, I hate the way these things work, I have to tell you. It's so frustrating. Um, so that's not good either because I have to name it the same thing in the vertex shader as it's named in the fragment shader because that's the way they get bound. I can't call it what it is in each of them, which is the input and the output to that shader because you don't have the option of doing that, right? So maybe result color is the best way to go and I should just change... Um, and I should change the places where I was using frag color uh, to actually be result color. Ugh. So bad. Because, I mean, so if you think about this, right? This is a separate aside. So it's so clear how these are not properly designed for what they do in terms of nomenclature. First of all, how you have a void main void being the thing that's supposed to do this operation, it's like it should be defined as accepting the parameters that it accepts and outputting the things it outputs, right? So this should be a struct that has the things in it that it outputs, and this should be a struct that has the things in it that it takes, or something. So you can see the inputs and the outputs of this thing as a function. That would be what would actually make sense. Instead, you always have global variables, and the global variables are supposed to line up with, like, something else declared global that is writable in the other one, but readable by you. It's just, it's nuts. It, like, it, I don't know, it's just a very strange way. Uh, and it, it leads to these sort of tortured naming conventions, like the thing that I'm having to mess with now, where it's like, I... 
I want to name this a different thing in each function. The input and the output of the function should be able to be named input and output. But I can't name it input and output because if I did that, it wouldn't line up and it's required to. So you can't call the output of the vertex shader the output because then in the fragment shader it would be called output, which it's not, right? Uh, whatever. Uh, all right, so we pretty much have to have a naming convention uh, that respects the fact that each of these things has to have the same name. So that kind of means we'll have to call it what maybe the stage is. So let's adopt a stage naming convention. The input to a thing takes its name always. Uh, so in here we've got vert p, vert color, vert uv, frag uv, frag color, right? Exactly what we want. In here we've got frag uv, frag color, result color, not what we want. So what is result color? Well, result color is the blend unit's color, right? So we'll call this the blend unit color. And then everywhere we're going to write to that, we'll just call it blend unit color. All right. Uh, and then everything that comes into the fragment shader, again, should always be uh, titled frag. This is going to be a nightmare to get working again because of all these name changes. And uh, the compiler's error messages are not fabulous. Uh, but whatever, we'll live with it. Uh, so here in the fragment code, right, we've got uh, information coming in from here, smooth in. Uh, let's see, frag color, frag UV, that's what that should be. Result color is not supposed to be result color. Uh, and we'll just cross our fingers that we can get this working again. All right, so that looks all right. That doesn't. So that actually looks wrong. Uh, because that's not blending those two colors. Uh, so what was going on there? Are we writing incorrectly to those? Uh, so now we have to fix the frag color in these ones. So let's take a look at frag color. In the ZBIOS program, that's actually the correct name for it. Uh, let's put the outs like that. So there's the ins and the outs. Uh, there's the frag color, blend unit color. That all looks relatively straightforward. Uh, here's the resolve multi-sample. And that all looks fine as well. All right. Um, so then we've got the final stretch. Smooth in frag UV out vec4 blend unit color. That all looks good too. Now we have the fake seed lighting. Fake seed lighting looks like it's working correctly. However, frag color is not the right name there. Uh, frag color here has to be blend unit color. There we go. Uh, so that's all good. So looking at this, where we've got the blend unit color here in the two, so multi-light up, for example, uh, versus multi-light down. Just trying to see what we can make of this. So blend unit color out. For front emit and 
back emit here. So there's the problem. Uh, that looks like a bug we always had, not one we just introduced. There we go. All right. Um, so that all looks fine now. And let's try to figure out how we can get uh, our, our lighting values now written to, now that we have a sensible way of naming those things and we don't have to worry about the GL frag data problem uh, either. So if we want to now for compile fake seed lighting, uh, we can do the same thing. Uh, that we were doing compile fake seed lighting in, for example, like our resolve multi-sample pass or our compile zbias program. Uh, so if we take a look at compile zbias program, for example, now what we could do is where we had before our blend unit color, uh, we can instead have output to multiple textures. Now, what we defined when we said what we're gonna do is we, we would have three of these. There'd be reflect RGB and coverage A, that's the first one. Uh, the emit RGB and spread A, and then the NX and Y LPL, <coughs> LP0, LP1. Uh, so what we want to do here is say, okay, we're only writing the three things in this particular case. Uh, and so when we come out through here and do our blend unit color, uh, what I want to do uh, is, is sort of change up the names of these a little bit. So instead of blend unit color here, this is going to be surface reflect. Oops. Uh, so the surface reflectance there getting coded in sRGB, and that's fine. Uh, but regardless, when we get to here, now we've got blend unit color uh, zero equals surface reflect. Uh, blend unit color one should be equal to emit, which we haven't done yet. And blend unit color two should be equal to NPL. So we want to compute those other values there. And all of these values are only going to be computed if the alpha threshold is met. Uh, if we discard, we discard the whole thing, so we don't want to bother uh, computing any of this information uh, when the alpha drops below it. So what we need to do now is compute the emit, and we need to compute uh, the NPL. Now, we know the emit is going to be the emit RGB uh, plus the spread, and we know the NPL, oops, I assume you can do an RGB here. Like I assume you can do like a V3 plus an A. I don't remember if they allow that or not. Uh, this is gonna be the NX and Y uh, LP0, LP1, right? Which we don't know. I could also just write this out longhand like that. So that's how we need to pack these values. In order to produce those, some of them we have, some of them we don't. So you can see here, we've got a world normal. That will allow us to do the NX and Y directly. Uh, so what we wanna do here is produce that NX, NX and Y. Uh, the LP0, we're just gonna fill in uh, bogus values here. Um, but the NX and Y values, we can compute from the world normal N and the nor world normal Y. Yeah. Uh, so what we wanna do there is we want to pack these into an eight bit value, right? We don't wanna have to specify floating point frame buffers just to get this data uh, through to the lighting system where it will eventually use floating point for its computations, but we wanna encode it um, in, a, in a more straightforward way. So in order to do that, where we've got our world n, uh, x and y here, what we need to do is we need to take this, which we know is in the range of negative one to one, 
and we need to put it in the range of zero to one. Now, I don't remember, they might already have a way to do that directly. Uh, obviously, it's trivial for us to write, so we'll just write it, but I wanna double check that they don't have a, a utility function for that that automatically does this operation. It would just be a bias operation, basically. Uh, let's see if it's in here. Okay. Um, so here's built-in functions, common, uh, mod round, cross, face forward, not seeing much here. Um, I don't see it. So I'm assuming we will write it uh, because I don't see see it anywhere it would be in here uh, I would think because it's kind of like you know smooth step and these other ones that are pretty straightforward uh, little blendy sorts of things um, all right so what we want to do is we want to take this uh, value that's from negative one to one uh, and we just want to pack it down, right? Uh, so we wanna basically take it, it's too wide at the moment, right? Negative one to one, so it's, it's two units long. We wanna compress that down to one unit long, so we divide by two, right, 0.5. Uh, and then we gotta shift it up, because then it's negative 0.5 to positive 0.5, we just gotta shift it up from zero to one. So then those can be packed in here just fine, uh, and off we go. Now, we have to make sure our unpacker also handles that properly. Uh, so let's go ahead and double check that that's true. Uh, I don't know where that is. I know we had it in here somewhere. Here it is. Uh, so here you go. So here's reconstruct normal, uh, the pass of the MP. What you can see here is, yeah, it doesn't really, uh, because this is using these as if they were the actual values. Uh, which they are not at the moment. Although I guess since that's floating point, that's probably okay. Uh, so yeah, we can hold off on that. They're packed in here, but when we do the transfer, we'll have to unpack them. So that's fine. That's all good. Uh, NX. Uh, so that packs up the NPL vector. Uh, and so really all we need here is the emission vector uh, with the spread. So at the moment, I'm gonna call the emit spread uh, 1.0, uh, and again, to do Casey some way of specifying light emission. Um, so what I wanna do here is take the emit RGB, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna use the light P here, and I'm gonna do essentially what we do with the other, with the fake seed lighting. I'm gonna use that temporarily. So we're just gonna write one light in just like we were writing in before, only we're gonna write it in here instead of in our fake seed lighting program. So in here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, well, okay, uh, we know that we've got a light P minus world P uh, in terms of the distance to the light source. So I'm just gonna say whatever the length is of these things, if the length between the light P and the world P is less than, I don't know, a fifth of a meter or something, um, then the emission value is going to be something real, otherwise it's not. So we're gonna assume that the emission is nothing uh, unless you're at the light source, in which case we'll make the emission uh, be a, a bright red light uh, as before. And that'll be the brightest red light you can possibly have, right? Okay. Uh, so now we gotta debug the shader, uh, or not debug, uh, fix compiler as the shader. Uh, so surface reflect undeclared identifier, that is true. Um, redefinition error emit, oops. Uh, 
right, and I'll just go ahead and pack these in here. So we don't have more variables than necessary. Uh, so that's good. All right. Uh, so that looks all reasonable there. And the surface reflectance here again gets packed in. Um, and then written out. So I think that's all fine. Uh, let's look at the next compiler. All right, so it looks like we're good. Uh, so now we need to actually get that data over uh, somehow, so we're writing that out, right? And now we need to actually do something with it. Uh, now what we can do here, if we're feeling particularly saucy, is we could view this uh, directly. So whatever the actual information is that's getting output, uh, by one of these fragment traders, we could grab it and use it uh, in our uh, lighting computation directly already, uh, because in theory, well, okay, I guess that's not true. So we need one more step, which is we need to have the multi-sample resolve also take it into account, right? Um, so the multi-sample resolve here uh, needs to be able to read from these other buffers and write them out as well. So in addition to having just that one color sampler, uh, which it's going to fetch from, it needs to sample from the other two as well. So in addition to just the surface reflectance one, it needs to take the emit and the MPL, right? Uh, so in here where it's taking up the sum of the samples, uh, the same would be true presumably for the emit and the MPL. Uh, you know, again, we don't really have a sane idea for how we would be treating the NX NY or the LP0, LP1 or whatever uh, when they get blended together. So when you're at a when you're at a corner pixel, a pixel that's covered by multiple people, uh, we just have to pick something to do with it in terms of what its emission spread NX NY and LP0, LP1 are. So we can just blend them together and cross our fingers because there's no right answer for that really unless we computed everything at the multi-sample level, which we don't really want to do, I don't think. Um, so anyway, uh, so here what we're going to have is we're going to have multiple color samplers here. We're going to have a color sampler, an emit sampler, uh, and an MPL sampler, right? Uh, and when we do these fetches, uh, we've decided we're not doing anything fancy there. Uh, so we're going to take, <clears throat> Jimmy. Uh, we're going to take the color fetch and just duplicate it out like so. So same exact process, same exact everything. Uh, and then what we want to do is we want to just sum those together. Uh, into the combined emit, combined NPL. Uh, so up here we've got a combined color, a combined emit, and a combined NPL. Each of those things starts at zero, it sums up, and then in the end when we need to actually write these out, uh, then we have to go ahead and do the, uh, the computation. Now this right here is this blend unit color bit here. Uh, this is the actual uh, surface reflect. So this is actually uh, right. So this is actually the surface reflect and then when we do the the texture uh, sRGB right, we would, uh, if we were simulating that, we would do the power ourselves there. 
So, which I think we always do currently because we get bugs if we don't do it currently, although in the future when we change our art asset format, we might be able to get rid of that and let the card do it. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, moving along there, we've got our combined colors. Now we need, uh, for the other two, we need to do the same thing. Uh, so here what we wanna do is we wanna take our blend unit color zero and make that equal to the surface reflect. We wanna take blend unit color one and make that equal to the emit, blend unit color two, make that equal to the MPL. And so in each of those cases, when we're writing those in, uh, we need to take the inverse sample count, multiply them to get that blending to occur, uh, just like we did with the surface reflect. Uh, and that's really about it. Uh, so that will blend out the rest of those. Uh, we just need now to make sure that we're grabbing um, that blend unit color uh, as definition with the layout specifier uh, so that we know that it all goes to the right uh, location. Uh, so let's take a look at resolve multi-sample here. We just, uh, here we're writing to the blend unit color. We just need to uh, have that be defined here, right? And we're only writing the three of them. So now that should also write to them. The only trick there is we need more samplers now uh, because we're reading from multiple textures. So this uh, part where we have to actually write to these, we need um, an emit sampler and an MPL sampler. Those both need to get bound. Uh, so that's in the resolve multi-sample program. Uh, like so. So when we do that resolve, those need to get set up. Uh, so when color sampler in our use program begin uh, for resolve multi-sample. We need these to all be lined up somehow. Um, and I guess I'll just do them. I guess preserving the order they used to be in. So the zero and one is for the color and the depth, the emit and NPL samplers will come after. Uh, and so when we do the multi-sample resolve, actually, you know what? That doesn't really make any sense. Let's put the depth sampler first and then all the colors because then that way the colors are contiguous. That seems more reasonable to me. Uh, so when we do resolve multi-sample now, where is that actual function? There it is. Uh, so when we do resolve multi-sample, uh, what I want to be able to do here is a for I loop. Uh, and so that we can uh, set the active textures up again. Now, I don't know why we felt the need to clear the active texture here, uh, to be honest with you. I don't know that that's really necessary. Um, I feel like it shouldn't be because every time we set all the textures that we're gonna use, so it just seems like active texture is the only thing that needs to get reset in case people are not using it somewhere even though really hopefully they would be. Uh, but let's go ahead and do a, a for I loop here. Color index equals zero, color index is less than uh, open gel. Well, I guess it's a rate count in this case. Well, no, it's open gel. Color count, where is that? Where did, did I put that? So texture zero is the depth handle. Texture one plus whatever color index we're on is gonna be the color handle uh, in this case. Then we will draw and then we will unbind. I'm just gonna say uh, that this is gonna work. I don't know that it actually will. Um, but hopefully now the resolve will work properly. Uh, let's see, undeclared emit and undeclared NP. L. So let's take a look at why we're getting those undeclareds. Um, uh, that's in here. So we've got uh, 
Yeah, so this is supposed to be combined emit and combined MPL. All right. Uh, so now we've got that stuff going, but we don't know if it's working properly. And the easiest thing we can do first, just to make sure we didn't, uh, you know, to, to get the really bad bugs out of the way first, uh, I can switch back to showing the game render to see if we still get it. Uh, and surprisingly to me, we do. Uh, so that's pretty good, obviously. Um, so we are able to render uh, the, the world properly. And in theory, we're also rendering the other uh, buffers at the moment too. Now, when we do, at, at that point, uh, when we do our uh, lighting view, right, which is this, uh, in theory now, I think I should be able to take the bottom level of the compute light transport and get it from the peel buffers instead. Uh, so we can see what we're actually drawing there. So uh, uh, what we need to do is, is uh, actually have a way of transferring one to the other. At the moment, we don't actually have a way to do that uh, because we have to write a shader to do it. But um, before we do that, we can, in theory, view the emission part of things because that will translate over properly. It's not encoded in any weird way or anything. Uh, so if we want to now, what we could say is, well, when we, when we do our multi-light, um, let's see, multi-light down, we just need, oh, it's a transport light. So when we do our compute light transport, right? Normally we're starting here at source life, light buff index is gonna be zero. Uh, and we do these binds here, right? The, the bind textures and that all makes sense. Uh, but what I could do is I could say, well, if the source light buff index happens to equal zero, what I can do is override what you were gonna get the front emission texture from uh, and say, well, instead, why don't you get that from uh, the peel buffer uh, instead, right? So then we can say, well, the depth peel resolve buffer Uh, for depth peel zero uh, has the color buffers in it, right? So it's this one here. Uh, we could go ahead and peel out, for example, the emission from there, right? And now just that first time, we're gonna pick up that uh, depth peel buffer. I'm gonna comment out the down phase Just to keep things a little simpler, uh, and oops, that's under OpenGL. So again, just reaching directly into that depth field buffer and starting with that as the source so we can see what got written to, to it at all, right? Um, that cannot possibly be true. I do not believe what I'm seeing. Uh, so death light buff index, source light buff index, source light buff index at the opening should be zero. So what we should see, oh no, that's fine. Uh, so we're not copying it over, so that is actually correct. So it's the next one up that we would have to look at to see what we were drawing in. And so we see nothing, so that's not a good sign, right? That means our first sample up got, got nothing. Uh, out of the emission there, uh, which is not fabulous. Not fabulous at all. Uh, however, I would point out that I don't remember all of the mojo you have to do to enable frame buffer output. Uh, I don't remember if you have to do GL enables for that. So let's just double check that we don't have to do some kind of um, uh, nonsense for this. So when we do begin screen fill, so it doesn't look like we really have to.
All right, so it doesn't look like we really have to. So let's start by debugging this uh, one slow step at a time. So here's our compile uh, for the resolve multi-sample. So when we do the resolve multi-sample, what I'm going to do again is the same debugging technique I've done every time here since we don't really have any GPU debugging on this machine, sadly. Uh, we've got a blend unit color that we're writing out 0, 1, 2. And what I want to do is verify that this is actually happening uh, the way that I think it is. So I'm going to go to the place where we're actually specifying uh, the debug part here, and I'm going to get rid of that. So now I should be able to see what, I, what I'm looking at uh, should be the game, right? And that's the first surface reflect uh, thing that gets written out there. So the next thing I'm going to do is now I, I know that I'm viewing that correctly. So what I want to do is take the combined emission value that I'm outputting and reroute that to be in place of what was what I was just seeing. So now I can see what I'm writing out of surface emission, right? So here's what I'm supposedly writing out uh, into the surface emission buffer. Okay. Uh, now one thing you'll notice there is the surface emission of the background is gray. We'll have to fix that because we don't really want that to be happening. Um, but we can fix that later. And so already you can see I've got a problem. If I write the uh, combined emission out there, I'm not seeing any emission. I'm not seeing any written emission in there, uh, which is already a little bit broken. Because what I should be seeing instead of that uh, is I should be seeing a light somewhere. Uh, so we have to fix that. Right, that needs to be fixed. Let me also see what I'm getting uh, for NPL. Uh, so oddly enough, NPL is looking pretty reasonable. Um, it's not what I would have expected. So it's not quite right, but it's not quite wrong either. So couple things that are wrong with it. Um, yeah, you can kind of see we're getting like yellow for things that should be pointing upwards. So things that should be pointing upwards should actually be black. Uh, and things that are pointing left and right do look like they're sort of zero and one at the moment uh, in greens or red channels. Uh, so that's a little bit better, but it looks kind of slightly wrong. While we're on that subject, I think I might as well go in and uh, and take a look here at uh, the ZBIAS program. Here it is. <clears throat> uh, and if we take a look at this here, what we want to know is why are we getting uh, weird values for the NX and Y here? So the world normals, in this case, we're compressing them down to that range. And so what we would expect to see is that if the normal was pointing upward in Z, uh, we would expect like, so for those cube, the tops of those cubes, world N and world, uh, world NX and world NY should both be zero. Uh, and in that case, what we expect the output to be would be 0.5. So it should not have been bright yellow. It should have been like, half yellow, 128, 128, like a mustard, right? Uh, so it's not super wrong. Uh, it's, it's, it's not super wrong. It's just too bright yeah, it would be the only way to say it, right? It's too bright. Uh, now, I don't know whether there's any RGB uh, conversion happening there. I don't think there should be because uh, I don't want those to be interpreted as sRGB, so hopefully they're not, uh, but I don't actually know that that's true at the moment. So what I do want to do probably in this case is make sure that they're not being encoded sRGB, uh, and that's actually pretty easy to do. So when we come through here, uh, instead of default frame buffer texture format, in this case, 
uh, what I can do here is say that uh, for color buffer uh, zero, maybe that's true. So if color index is zero, uh, then it's that. Otherwise, it's GL RGB uh, A8, uh, which is not an sRGB format, right? Because I, I don't want... Uh, I don't want any any funny business there at all. I just want them encoded in, in a straightforward fashion. Right. Uh, so let's just verify that that's the case, but I, I think that that's probably the case. Uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> although they aren't getting encoded in, now that I think about it, they will be getting decoded by squaring, so that could actually be part of it. Um, so those normals may actually not be wrong. Uh, so let's hold off on trying to debug those. Q&A begins now in theory, but I want to keep uh, playing with this just a little bit. Um, so let me just go ahead and uh, in that resolve there, where's the resolve? Resolve multi-sample. Can't see because it's behind the banner. Um, so what I want to do here is I want to take uh, the emission and put that back in there. Let's do that there. And I just want to look here uh, at the thing that's supposedly writing out the emission and see why I'm not getting any of that uh, emission writing happening, right? Uh, so when I run this, like I said, I should I expect to see nothing here, uh, the, the blackness that we saw before. And so I want to make sure that there's nothing trivially going wrong. So I'm just going to write red. Yeah. Uh, so here's the other thing that I was thinking about. Uh, we we have to make sure that blending is off, but I'm pretty sure it is. So let's just make sure that if I write red with zero in the alpha channel, that it still comes through. Okay, so I wanted to make sure that that's the case, and that's good. However, it looks like it's getting added, uh, because what you can see here is there's actually like addition looking like it's happening there. Um, which should not be the case. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, GeoBlend, to the extent that it's on, uh, I want to make sure that GeoBlend is not occurring in any untoward way. So GeoBlend is supposed to be disabled. Uh, so in theory, that blending must be coming from somewhere else. I don't know about maybe if it's coming from the multi-sample resolution somehow, although I can't say I know how that would be happening. So this is a little suspicious. We may have to do more debugging next weekend on this. Uh, however, uh, just taking a look at, at that as well, uh, we do know that emissions should be getting written out now. So I should be able, just before we finish, I should be able to fix this particular um, bug with not having emission by looking at maybe what's wrong with our light equation uh, the length light P minus world P situation. Uh, so what I should be able to do is take the emission here as we were doing it before uh, with the emission RGB emit spread that's happening here. Uh, I should be able to take this length light P minus world P. That should be working. Uh, and I don't know why it's not. So...
So previously we were definitely using light P and world P and we were subtracting the two to determine what was going on. And so it does seem kind of strange that I can't subtract them now and get what should be basically just a circle, right? Um, I can widen this out to something very large uh, and see if that makes any difference. And it does. So that's kind of weird. So somehow the length of that being less than one is insufficient. Uh, oh, you know why? Because it's above the head. So it's got to, it's like a light that's got to kind of be, I see. It's a light that's a sphere and the sphere was hovering a little too high. Okay, so at least now we've got a sphere of light that's basically just anything that's in that side that sphere uh, gets set to a lighting value, which is what I wanted. Okay, uh, so now I should be able to stop uh, cheating, stop moving that over um, unnecessarily here. So there's surface reflect. Uh, and now we should be rendering to all of those places. And if I go down and look now, um, when I do comp uh, the, the transport light, here we are. Uh, when I do this lighting transport, if now I, uh, well, actually, I guess I should turn it on first. Uh, if now I look at what happens uh, for, for that as the input, I should be able to see, uh, yeah, as I go, up, I get a blurry version of the actual light that's coming out from the game, right? Uh, as you can see there. Uh, so now I should be able to also turn back on the light transport down, like so. Uh, and now I should be able to see, uh, yeah, essentially like glowy hero, right? Um, so yeah, like you can see, uh, I'll go to the Q&A now. Definitely making uh, progress here. This is the way graphics programming tends to go. You know, when you're working with GPUs, you kind of got to go slowly through it. Uh, and it takes a while to get things all sorted out because of the incredible amount of busy work. The programming paradigm for GPUs just isn't good. There's not a lot of other ways you can say it. Uh, it requires the programmer to do a lot of stupid work that's not necessary. Uh, and that's just the way it goes. Uh, but, you know, the reward for doing it is nice because you have all this extra horsepower, all these extra flops you can take advantage of, uh, which, is, which is pretty cool, right? Um, so we're getting there. Uh, so what we have to do, like I said, as we kind of go uh, further forward here, uh, is we just have to sort of take it one step at a time and uh, make sure we verify results from each stage to each stage. When we're done with getting the transfer over, which we've mostly done, we just need one more shader, which transfers those uh, game output textures to inputs for front, back, surface, and NP tech uh, by doing the translation over. Once we move that over, we're in position to just start iterating on our lighting uh, solution, which again is gonna take a while because we kind of need to figure out how to do a bunch of stuff in there uh, using a lot of approximated hacks, right? Uh, but then we're great uh, because we have the complete conduit going uh, through the system, so now we can get data from the game into the lighting system, which is what we need, uh, and we can do it in an arbitrary way. So we can have any sprites that we want light up, which is nice, right? Miblo asked, we can set the spread of the emitter, but we can also, but can we also set the direction of the spread? Uh, yes, yeah. so the, the idea is that we have two pieces of information coming out of the render. We have the normal of the sprite, like whichever way the sprite was facing, right? 
uh, we have that piece of information. Uh, and right now, we are rendering just the direction the actual sprite is facing. That may not be what we actually want to save for the direction of the emitter. We may want to be able to specify a false emitter, right? Uh, so basically, like, if we were rendering a sprite uh, and we wanted to say, like, yeah, the sprite is facing this way, but it's actually emitting that way, uh, we could specify a different normal for the emission part, right? Uh, and the way that we would do this is just by recognizing that the emission thing, the part where the light is emitting, we don't really care about the reflectance. So we can just render two sprites, the emitter sprite, which has a fake normal that we set, uh, and then, um, uh, because I guess the other part to remember is, Remember that the normal is not used for any rendering operation whatsoever, right? The normal is not computed from the actual polygon. It's just an additional value that we send down. So when we render lights, we can render lights with a direction that is, has nothing to do with anything, right? This, if they're a sprite card with a light on it, um, that's a particular pattern, we can set what direction that is facing, right? Uh, and it will work just fine. Um, Valbus, why not doing a marathon stream in lighting? Maybe if doing so will be more productive as you remember what hack you have done and maybe forgot the next weekend. Uh, yeah, we definitely could do that. When we're ready to really hit the lighting hard, so when this whole pipeline is working properly and we have some lighting, because like next weekend we'll have actual lighting working in the sense that it'll be wrong, but we'll see it in the game and playing off of surfaces and whatever totally wrongly. Uh, when we then go to sort of, okay, now we've really got to work out, you know, experiment with different ways of transporting this light around um, and how we do our iterations and who writes to what and whether we do, you know, what are the values we actually propagate around? Do we try to use spherical harmonics for transfer? Or do we try to do emitter directions for transfer like we're doing now, blah, blah, blah. Um, as we sort of work on that part, it might make sense to do longer streams. Uh, Napoleon89, don't know if this is the right place, but with your assert macro, it could currently cause bugs if you place it inside uh, an if else that doesn't use curly braces uh, adding an else to this macro could solve this. Uh, yeah, I don't really allow, for lack of a better term, if else's without brackets. Um, if there's an if else in my code that doesn't have brackets, that's that's a bug in my opinion, right? Like, I would prefer the compiler just told me, like, I would prefer the compiler require brackets. I would turn that on. Uh, because I don't think the syntax in C for if else is very good, and as a result, it you know it produces bad problems of the form that you talk about, right? Uh, where you know it's it's ambiguous to the compiler. The compiler might not be able to figure out um, what you were trying to do. Uh, as for the bug that you're talking about, uh, inside an if else that doesn't use curly braces. Uh, then yeah, again, you would end up with the ambiguous, the hanging else problem, but I don't allow that in the code. So I don't usually think about that or care about that, if that makes sense. Psychomaniac TV, I have been looking into compression schemes for skeletal animation data. Currently I have only implemented basic quantization, but I would like to add curve fitting to the mix. Could you give me some pointers on this? If I were to use Catmo ROM splines, what are some methods on estimating the error of a segment and finding a good split point, how could I apply this stuff to quaternions? Um, let me see if there's any questions on the uh, on the actual episode first. Do you plan to allow Sprite to use emit textures that could, for example, make eyes glow? Uh, yeah, so the idea would just be that 
any time you wanted to have emission in the artwork, you could just render an emission sprite with that pattern and it would glow and cast light. Um, I don't know that that will be achieved, but that's like what we're trying, right? And we'll see how well we do. Uh, Chris has 42, alternative if else syntax. Uh, well, the alternative if else syntax, in my opinion, is just requiring brackets, right? Um, I, I just feel like brackets should be required for that because they're the only thing that makes it clear what is the body of something. Like, I feel like there should always have been the notion that control blocks have to take a block, not a statement, is what I would have said, right? Um, it's two extra characters. You know, I don't, it doesn't add a significant amount of typing. Like, I, I don't like extra typing, certainly, so I understand why people wouldn't want a lot of extra typing in there, but it's two extra characters. I just don't see that as being saving those two characters and in return getting this really bad ambiguous syntax just doesn't seem like a win, you know? Masyota says, about the NXNY LP0, LP1 texture, is a 16-bit texture worse than a 32-bit texture in any way? I felt like you added LP0 and LP1 just because it wouldn't make much of a difference performance-wise. Is that true? Uh, no, it's not true. Um, performance-wise, I do think RGBA and RGB are probably preferred memory unpack-wise, but I suspect RG is fine now as well. I, like, I, I don't know. I've never really played with that, but I would suspect that RG is faster than RGB or RGBA because it's just less bandwidth. So I don't think that, it's just, what I was looking at that, I was like, well, I could treat these as four uniform textures that are, I have three uniform textures that are all exactly the same. And when I thought about that, I was like, that's got a nice, uh, it makes it, the code a little bit easier to deal with on the outside. And so what I thought of in my head was, do I think I'll need extra space? Or should I bother? Because I don't want to prematurely clip it down and then end up going, oh wait, I actually needed more params anyway. And so what I thought was, well, we're probably going to want to specify some parameters for lighting here. Um, because, for example, if we do have any kind of ability to have glossy versus diffuse surfaces, I'm going to need at least one more parameter for that. Uh, and then if we decided to do some other kind of encoding, like supposing that we, instead of storing the emission, we just stored... Uh, let's say we get rid of that emission texture and just instead store either surface reflectance or emittance and we set another parameter to say the emittance amount, uh, then that would be two four wide textures, which maybe is the better way to go now that I think about it. I didn't know I didn't think about that ahead of time. Uh, in fact, that seems a lot smarter. Why didn't we do that? Uh, so I feel like that's actually a lot smarter. Um, if we just stored NPL here and it was like emission and specular, and I guess we wouldn't have any place to put the spread amount, but we could say that everything is just generally, yeah, I don't know. I'll leave it like this for now, but I feel like that's,
Uh, so we should think about that a little bit because we could get rid of a whole texture at that point. Uh, because if we assume that surfaces are just always one color and then they emit a certain amount, uh, I feel like that is probably the better way to go because then we don't have to write to an entire other texture, which probably isn't really necessary. Uh, Alex Kelbo, off topic. I'm playing with the debug cycle counters. Is there a way to find out how long Windows puts our process to sleep? I'm missing millions of cycles in my main loop. Uh, yes, you can figure that out, but it is incredibly, incredibly difficult. So, um, so if you search for the worst API ever made, uh, you will get a blog entry by me where I talk about the way you can get this information from Windows, uh, I highly recommend not doing it. The reason I highly recommend not doing it is because it is the worst API ever made. And so the chances that you will even get it working a little bit are is like zero. Um, it's not just a bad API. It's not just a horrible API. It's literally so incredibly terrible that I literally cannot imagine the thought process that arrived at it. I, I cannot even... I have no idea how someone who could create such a thing actually thinks about programming in their head. It's so foreign to me. It's like... I just, I can't even, I, I, it's, I'm dumbstruck when I look at it. So unfortunately, even though that data should be incredibly easy to get, the data that you're asking for should be a trivial one function call to Windows, something like, give me my process sleep history buffer, please, and you look at it, it is instead literally hundreds of API calls that are incredibly obtuse, very difficult to get working, require administrator privilege, and uh, are globally required to be set uniformly across the entire system just to use. It's insane. Uh, IWUMBO, how do you define a good API and a bad API, or do you have examples of very good APIs? Uh, the definition of a good API versus a bad API actually isn't as hard as you would think. Um, a good API is an API which has a number of API calls proportional to the number of things you are trying to do, generally speaking, and does them efficiently, right? A bad API is the opposite of that in either case, right? So for example, with event tracing for Windows, uh, that API should be roughly two calls long, probably. Uh, the first call would pass, for example, an array uh, or a series of flags, however you wanted it, which are the events that you wanted to trace. Uh, so it would be like begin trace, here are the flags. And then the second call would be end trace, here is a buffer to put them into, or end trace, give me a buffer back, and then there's one more API to free it. Either way, right? Uh, this would be foolproof. Um, you know, almost nobody could mess that up. Uh, it's trivial to learn, requires almost no documentation. Uh, very, very straightforward, right? Instead, Uh, what they decided to do was first, um, and you know, I, one of the things I did was I show at the top of this what it should probably look like, right? I was like, if you were just going to implement this the dumbest way possible, and you know, you weren't trying to be e even remotely clever with the API, you just sat down and did the first thing that the average programmer should probably think of, this is the code, right? Uh, and here is the API. So I specified what a good API would look like. And again, by good in this case, I'm not even saying exceptionally good. I'm just saying this is just the basic thing that just has the stuff the programmer does. It's like they begin a trace, 
they end a trace, and they get events from the trace. That's what they do, so that's the API, right? Uh, and then I specified what some more complicated versions would look like if you were trying to do something fancier. Uh, and then I also said, well, if you wanted to have other retrieval methods, so I said, let's get more complicated. How complicated could it get? At this point, you're kind of out of ideas. Like when you sort of get to here, you're like, I don't know how I would make this any more complicated. This problem is so simple, I don't know how to make it more complicated. Like it's, it's basically mem copy. Like I was saying, like they're, it's like designing the API for mem copy. Yeah, you could sort of start to make it more complicated, but how complicated can you really get with a mem copy? And the answer is they came up with whole new ways. So for example, they came up with a way that in order to get a trace on Windows, you have to create a thread. I'm not kidding. You can't get a trace without creating a separate thread first. How do you get from give me a buffer of events, which is so simple, to I have to create a thread, right? I don't know. They, they did it. They, they, made, they made it happen, right? At, at Microsoft, nothing is impossible. They're like, we, could, we can do it. I know we can take an API that's essentially memcopy and require the user to make a thread, right? Uh, so I'd encourage you to look through this and just see what I'm talking about. It's nuts. Uh, you know, you've got to specify all these GUIDs in here and you've got to set all this stuff up. Uh, you've got to include a whole ton of header files, right? Uh, so instead of just including one header file, it's like, here's the tracing functions, right? You've got to call start trace. Um, and you've got to call this, this uh, start trace thing uh, in some weird way that I forget what it is. Uh, you can't do it this way. You have to create a buffer that you malloc to put the name in uh, because you need to name it something and the name has to be in some kind of permanent, I don't even remember. Oh, the name has to be attached to the end of the struct that you pass in. So instead of passing the struct and the name separately, you have to concatenate them together first by allocating a thing, copying the name into the offset buffer, which they don't give you any utility functions for, so you have to do it. Um, you then have to make these control calls and then copy the name in using a different thing in a separate place. So it has to be there and it also has to be here. Uh, you then have to open the trace because starting the trace and opening the trace are different things. Uh, you have, and you can see like all these things are just building up on top of each other. Uh, you have to set a bunch of things in this structure to like point to callbacks that are gonna happen when it goes and then you can open it and then you've got a thread callback where it's gonna call you back you had to do that on the on a separate thread because it's going to then lock up that thread just sitting there waiting to call this callback. It's going to call this callback. You can't actually get the callback unless you call process trace. Um, I'm forgetting a bunch of these things, but like that's roughly how they made it work. And it, it's just nuts. You know what I mean? Like it's like, it's so far away from anything that, should ever happen in an organization shipping an API that I just, I can't even imagine how they got to it. It's gotta be really special. I'd love for someone to have done the like, archeology span on the series of check-ins that led up to that being released as an API. Cause I'd love to see how it grew to be that thing, right? Um, because you, you know there's got to be a lineage there. You don't just sit down and write that, I hope, uh, as your API, right? Like you have some um, sort of series of things. But if you want to try and get that API working, and heaven help you if you do, but if you want to, that is the only way, at least that I know of, uh, that's how you get uh, the information out of Windows as to when it put your task to sleep. So if you're trying to determine when you got switched away, uh, that is the only way I know of to do it. Now, if you just want to know how many total cycles you did, uh, you got slept, um, there may be some way to do that. I'm not sure. Like you may be able to query a performance counter of some kind that will tell you just that information. And by diffing the two, you could get just the cycles back. 
but you wouldn't necessarily, I don't know if you'd know which thread that was on, so it might be hard for you to tell um, who to attribute it to, but you could try to get that out that way, which would be a lot less painful potentially, right? Uh, so I think I'm going to close it down. The the uh, question before that was off topic um, as well, which is about uh, how do you do c compression of animation data? Uh, I guess what I'd say about that is that's kind of a large topic. And uh, I sort of gave a talk on this a long time ago. Uh, I gave one at the GDC and one in Korea on the topic. Uh, it was included in sort of a larger topic that was like on how to do exporting. And uh, I can't really reprise it in a short amount of time. I mean, basically there's a lot of, a lot of aspects to it. Uh, the one I did for Granny is a least squares curve fitter. And it kind of uses just some heuristics to determine where to refine the curves. And, you know, that is at, at this point 17 year old technology. So you can do a lot better than it now uh, by taking into account a lot more stuff and you, cause you got a lot more horsepower too. And I think we understand the problem a lot better now, you know, back when we originally did this, uh, it was kind of, I don't want to use the word cutting edge because it's not really that, it's more just like, not, it wasn't really being done hardly anywhere when I did it. Um, and so I, I feel like now we've kind of gotten a, a lot more visibility into how that sort of stuff can work and what ways you can do it. And so uh, I don't know if, if someone has put out some good information on that somewhere, but it's kind of in depth and you would want like a whole talk, uh, you know, a whole, sort of lecture or paper on it that was sort of a practical one, not a research paper like here are some theoretical ways we've tried compressing splines, but rather something that's like here at Naughty Dog, you know, we store our splines in this format and we compress them this way or something, right? Like um, I feel like somebody should have been putting out a modern one of that by now, but uh, since I haven't looked for anything like that myself, I don't know. I, I just feel like it should be there. You know, it's, it's, it's not a super hard problem, but it does require some elbow grease and it is, um, a bit subtle and it does take experience. You know, you have to have worked with animation and understand how, uh, things work and what, uh, goes on in there and how you you know what you have to do with quaternions in this case as well and, and all that stuff but uh, Frosty Ninja speaking of ever thought of releasing old talks you've done if you still have slides notes and the like laying around uh, yeah so I, I have thought about it a little bit I don't know uh, how much utility there is in that exactly but uh, you know, I, I do, I have thought about maybe trying to redo the talks, um, you know, on stream sort of a thing. Uh, and like, so that I'd have a, a recording of them because I don't have recordings, I don't think, of a lot of them. But like, for example, uh, here's the GDC one that I gave, uh, and this has the information in it, it's in fact, that, that you were, uh, that not you, but the person who was 
uh, asking about the curve fitting, uh, you can see here. Uh, so here's like what I was using. And again, this is, this is basically 17 years ago because I did it in like 2000, 2001. Uh, and so this lecture was 2002. So even the lecture itself is 15 years old at this point. So, you know, like I said, it's old information, probably not at all how I'd write it today, but it's, you know, it did ship in lots and lots of games. So it's good enough for that, I guess. Um, so, uh, you know, you can kind of see that I've got uh, the outline of the algorithm here and uh, I talk about how you can um, use linear uh, quaternions as a linear approximation. Uh, a, you, you can use real quaternions as an approximation to orientation quaternions uh, to give you a result you can actually use but still be linear. Um, and uh, I talk about oversampling the input to, you know, to get a Nyquist uh, thing in your into your solver. Um, I talk about how you sample from the various things and uh, talk about how you transform into places. I, I, I don't know if I've got the curve fitting stuff in here. Uh, the Korea one might be more in depth. Uh, that's probably in the pipeline here. Uh, yeah, so you can see the curve fitter here um, in operation on a 2D curve, for example. Uh, and you can see that it just starts with a minimum curve uh, and fits it. And it looks at the error across the curve to each individual sample. Uh, and it adds knots uh, progressively until it can sort of fit uh, to the data and you can sort of figure out how closely you want it to match and it'll stop at the part where it needs to, right? Uh, and there's a lot of reasons why this isn't the best approach, but uh, like I said, it does work. Uh, it's just for these days, I'd probably do something more heavyweight uh, than that. But anyway, uh, I don't know if, if I talk, yeah, I guess I don't really talk about it anymore. So, yeah, sorry. So I, I don't know that you, I ever really talked about this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this didn't have any. Yeah. All right, uh, let's see. I think I'll close it down now. Um, let's, let's go ahead and wrap it up. All right, thank you everyone for joining me for the episode of Handmade Hero. It's been a pleasure coding with you as always. If you uh, would like to follow along with the series at home, you can always peer to the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with a source code so you can uh, play around with it and learn from it and do your own experimentation. We also have a forum site you can go to if you want to uh, ask questions about stuff we've done. There's a Patreon page to go to if you want to support the video series, a schedule bot uh, that tweets the schedule at you if you want to know when we're going to be live, and an episode guide for catching up on old episodes. Uh, that's it for this week. I'll be back next week. I believe i got to check my calendar, but I believe, always check the schedule bot. I believe we'll be back next week. Uh, to finish up getting the lighting working through the pipeline entirely and, and then start playing with the lighting transfer until we get something uh, that we think is usable for the game. Uh, that's about it. Until then, have fun programming and I'll see everyone on the internet. Take it easy, everybody.